third grade, it's Mrs. Feathers. Um, this week you have your second benchmark TDA of the year. That means that we cannot help you the whole way through it, but I am going to give you some pointers and get you started with your TDA. We want you to do your best work um, and just put forth your best foot forward and try your best with this assignment so that we can see where your writing skills are at the moment. Today, we're going to take a look at our prompt. I'm going to read you the story, and then I will do the first evidence and first inference with you on your chart. You will need to finish the chart on your own. This prompt is very similar to the last prompt that we did for our instructional, which was the one that people got inspiration from nature. This story is called The Amazing Wildlife of the Mojave. And the prompt states that in the story, The Amazing Wildlife of the Mojave, the central idea is that animals have to adapt to challenges in their habitat in order to survive. The author uses text features to support the central idea. Use evidence from the text to support your analysis. Let's review what each sentence in a TDA prompt tells us. The first sentence gives you a little background of the story. The second sentence tells you where, what elements you are trying to prove. And your last sentence is reminding you to use evidence. This is an informational or nonfiction text. And I notice in the second sentence that it mentions text features and central idea. Central idea is given to me. It says that animals have to adapt to the challenges in their habitat in order to survive. So you are going to be looking for text features that prove animals have to adapt or change in order to survive in their environment or habitat. Remember, text features are anything other than the text. So things like um, headings, photographs, captions. I am going to read the text for you. I would like you to either follow along on this video or have it open on your own. Again, this is called The Amazing Wildlife of the Mojave. It's by Lawrence Pringle. And really be focusing on those text features as I read. Deserts are challenging places to live. They are dry and often hot. Every year, only a few inches of rain fall in the Mojave. It is North America's smallest desert. It lies mostly in parts of Southern California and Southern Nevada. The Mojave has both mountains and valleys. It includes Death Valley, the lowest and hottest place in North America. On a car ride through the Mojave Desert, you may pass, many, you may pass by many miles of bare, dusty earth and scattered bushes. However, on a morning hike, you can discover that a desert is a lively place. Birds sing, lizards scurry after insects, jackrabbits and roadrunners dash among the bushes and cactus plants. A living place. Although it is very dry, the Mojave is a living place or environment for many fascinating animals and plants. Over many years, they have changed or adapted, so they live very well in, the, in a dry, hot environment. They do this in different ways. In the Mojave, you might see several kinds of lizards. They are all related. All lizards are reptiles. 
reptiles all have scaly skin. However, they are different in many ways. The desert spiny lizard, for example, is only a few inches long. Most of its food is insects. On the top of the page, you have a photograph. The caption states, this hawk looks out for food from the top of a yucca palm. At the bottom, you have a map, and it states that the name Mojave means alongside water. It comes from the Mojave people. They were Native Americans who once lived along the lower Colorado River. The river flows through part of the Mojave Desert. The chuckwalla is very different. It can grow to almost three feet long. This big lizard eats leaves, flowers, and fruit of plants. It also has a special way of protecting itself. If a chuckwalla senses danger, it can quickly hide in a crack between rocks. Then it gulps in air, making its body fatter. It becomes tightly wedged in so that a predator cannot pull it out. You'll see a photograph of the chuckwalla, and then the caption reads, this chuckwalla will quickly squeeze itself between rocks if a predator comes near. Getting water in the desert. Animals get water in different ways in the Mojave. Coyotes, bobcats, and other large mammals can travel a long distance for a drink. So can some birds. Small lizards, snakes, and mice are different. They cannot travel far. They might prefer to drink from a stream or even a puddle, but they, these are rare treats in the desert. They find water in different ways. They get some from tiny drops of dew that form overnight on plants or stones. Their main source of water is the food they eat, flowers, seeds, and leaves contain water. The bodies of insects, scorpions, and other animals are all at least half water. Some desert animals get most or all of the water they need simply by eating food. The bottom of this page you see a photograph of a coyote and the caption reads, this coyote can travel far to find water. Light colors help. People who live in or visit deserts often wear light colored clothes. This is smart because dark colors take in or absorb sun energy, while light colors reflect it. You can avoid overheating by wearing light colors. Desert animals do the same by being light colored. Being light colored can help animals in another way. In the Mojave, the land is often colored tan, gray, and light brown. Pale mice, insects, or lizards are hard to see against this background. This gives the animals some protection from predators that try to catch and eat them. Not all desert animals are light colored. In some parts of the Mojave, mice and lizards are much darker. They are different because they live among rocks and soil that are black or dark brown. In those places, darker colors help them hide and survive. At the top, you'll see a photograph of a mouse, and the caption reads, light-colored fur helps this kangaroo rat hide from predators. Escaping the heat. Desert animals are all alike in one way. They find ways to avoid midday heat. Different animals do this in different ways. Most of them are resting during the hottest time of day. They are active in cooler times, such as mornings, evenings, or at night. Different animals avoid heat in different ways. Scorpions usually hide in shady places. However, if a scorpion must be out in daytime, it can stand tall on its legs. This is called stilting. It keeps the scorpion's body from touching the hot surface. A snake, of course, cannot stilt because it has no legs. 
On a hot day, some snakes and lizards crawl up into bushes. There, the air is cooler than on the hot soil surface. On the bottom of the page, you'll see a photograph of a scorpion, and the caption reads, A scorpion uses its legs to raise its body above the hot ground. Most desert animals also escape the heat by seeking shelter under bushes, rocks, and other shady places. Black-tailed jackrabbits sprawl in the shade. They lose body heat by panting or breathing rapidly. Heat is also given off from many tiny blood vessels in their large ears. Cool and safe underground. Many desert animals seek the coolness of underground burrows. The afternoon soil temperature may be as hot as 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Just a foot or two underground, the temperature might be 85 degrees. Burrows protect animals from heat and also from cold. Desert nights are often chilly. Winter snow sometimes falls in the Mojave. Desert tortoises spend most of their lives in burrows they dig. They come out in the spring to eat plant leaves, flowers, and fruit. Because their burrows are big and often several feet long, there is room for other animals too. A tortoise burrow is an excellent hiding and resting place for kangaroo rats, rabbits, snakes, lizards, owls, and other small desert creatures. Some join a sleeping tortoise. Others use an abandoned burrow. Um, the photograph on the bottom is of owl chicks, and it says these owl chicks make a comfortable home in this abandoned burrow. Some desert animals also use their hideouts in a different way. In the evening, scorpions wait just inside their shelters for their next meal. A lizard, beetle, or even another scorpion might pass by. These moving animals make ground vibrations that scorpions can feel. The vibrations alert scorpions that an animal is nearby. Some scorpions can sense vibrations in the air caused by a flying insect. They can reach out and grab a low-flying moth. The pho photograph of, at the top is of a tortoise and the caption reads, this hard shell of a tortoise, of a desert tortoise, protects it from predators. Morning warmth. Desert animals have many different ways to avoid overheating. Sometimes, however, they need to get warm. At night, the desert air is quite cool. By dawn, sometimes animals need to warm up. Lizards and snakes crawl to a sunny place. They turn their bodies toward the sun to raise their body temperature. Desert iguanas have an amazing ability for warming and also cooling. They change color. In the morning, their skin is dark. This helps them absorb heat from the sun. Then the day gets hotter and hotter. By early afternoon, the iguana's skin has turned white reflecting sunlight. Then, as the air becomes cooler in the evening, their skin darkens again. At the top, there's a photograph with a caption that reads, the desert iguana's skin turns pale in the afternoon to help it stay cool. At the bottom, the caption reads, the desert iguana's skin is dark in the morning. This helps the animal warm up. Like iguanas, some birds need to warm their bodies after a chilly night. Roadrunners turn their backs toward the sun and raise their body feathers. Their skin is black. It absorbs sun energy. When warm enough, roadrunners join in the competition for food. They dash to hunt for lizards and small snakes. Roadrunners live very well in deserts. Like all the other Mojave animals, they are wonderfully adapted to thrive in a dry, hot environment. So, so are scorpions, jackrabbits, chuckwallas, and tortoises. 
they all make the Mojave a, fasc a lively, fascinating place. At the top, there's a photograph. The caption reads, this roadrunner cools off in the shade of a tree. At the bottom, the caption reads, after warming up, this roadrunner is ready to run fast to catch its prey. That is the end of our story. So our next step would be to start our TDA charts. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I will help you get started with evidence one and inference one. And then I'll give you some pointers for the rest of the chart. So the first thing we need to do is just remind ourselves of the prompt. We are looking for text features that prove that animals have to adapt to their environment in order to survive. So for my first piece of evidence, I am going to mention the heading, Light Colors Help. Remember, I'm looking for text features as evidence, and text features include headings, maps, photographs, and captions. So I am going to say one text feature the author used was the heading light colors help. In my inference, I need to explain what the detail tells us. I'm going to say this explains how desert animals adapt their skin or fur to stay cool in the desert heat and are camouflaged from their predators. I'm actually going to add a little bit in my evidence and just explain a little bit about that section. So I'm going to say this heading identifies how important an animal's coloring is to survival. So I have one text feature the author used was the heading Light Colors Help. This heading identifies how important an animal's coloring is to survival. This explains how desert animals adapt their skin or fur to stay cool in the desert heat and are camouflaged from their predators. You now have a very good example of an evidence and an inference. You will need to go back in the story and find two more pieces of evidence and then also make two more inferences. Explain what those pieces of evidence tell you. Remember, your evidence should be text features. I am going to give you some sentence starters to help you finish up this chart. So for your second evidence, you can say the second piece of evidence the author used was A, and then you'll put in your next piece of evidence. This shows, and then you'll tell me what that evidence shows. For your last evidence, your sentence starter can be a third piece of evidence the author used was A. And let's go back to our sentence starter, this explains, to change it up a little bit. All right, third grade, remember, do your very best. 
I will be back tomorrow with a second video to just get you started and give you some pointers on your actual essay. If you have any questions, reach out to any of the ELA teachers and we will be leaving you comments on your charts to fix things before you actually write. Have a great day, third grade. Bye.